me, if you will, to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, and starting in verse 28. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, and verse 28. And when he, he being Jesus, had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord! Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he had drawn near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace? But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The problem that we have when we come to that passage, and the reason that it comes where it does in the order of the Beatitudes, is because we don't understand righteousness the way that we ought to. Or we understand it intellectually. But in our hearts, in the deeper parts of our being, we, we refute the intellectual knowledge. We refuse to fully acknowledge it and appreciate it and deeply understand it so that it shapes the way that we act. We understand righteousness and we say we hunger and thirst for it, but what we really hunger and thirst for is the kind of righteousness the people on Palm Sunday hungered and thirsted for. We seek the sort of satisfaction that they saw, and in so doing, we open ourselves up, not for satisfaction, but dissatisfaction, not to receive the fullness of the blessing that is ours in Christ, but to refuse that blessing and receive in place of it the exact opposite. In this time, in this place, the message of Palm Sunday needs to inform our understanding of the Beatitude. Let us pray. Father, you know the weakness of this hour. You have foreseen all of this, and you have made preparations well in advance, and you have determined what shall and shall not be. You have made plans that are greater than the plans of men. And while the plans of men have faltered and failed in every conceivable way, your plan goes on. Lord, have your way. Let your will be done. You know what is right. You define what is right. Lord, 
have mercy on us all. Speak to us now that we may be satisfied in you and in you alone. To you be all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, in this passage in the Gospel of Luke, he goes out of his way to make a statement in his interest. And his entrance into Jerusalem in the opening scene of the climactic act in the drama of redemption, he goes out of his way to subvert our expectations. We would be looking for Jesus to ride in on the white charger, as he will in his second coming. We would be expecting him to make a grand triumphal entry. We would expect a statement of his sovereign divinity, of his full glory. We would expect this victory to be announced in no uncertain terms, and that is exactly what Jesus does not do. He does not have a fine horse lined up for himself. And notice, it is lined up for him. He has prepared in advance uh, for his mount to be where it is. It is not his in the way that we often conceive of ownership. He doesn't go out and buy it. He doesn't even rent it. He borrows it. From the way that Jesus gives instructions, we see that he has arranged for it to be where it is. He knows where it is. It's waiting for him there. And he could have arranged for anything he had wanted. He could have had a mount inconceivable to men. He could have rode in on a pegasus, on a unicorn. He could have driven in in an automobile. He could have come at the head of a great procession of the heavenly host. But what he chose is a humble colt. This is not the entrance of a king, and yet he is proclaimed as a king by those who have followed him, who have seen his mighty work. They are giving him the royal treatment as he goes down this road to Jerusalem. This vast multitude hailing their king, laying down their garments in the dirt to make the pass before him. Why do they do this? would like to think that it's because they hungered and thirsted for righteousness, that these are honestly and earnestly the same people we see back in the beginning of the Gospels, back with John the Baptist, who are coming out to hear this message of repentance and to repent through this act of baptism to give outward sign of their inward condition. That they would like to turn back to God and to have a totally new beginning with Him. We would like to think that, that is what's going on, but we know the rest of the story. Even those who are closest to Jesus, they don't fully comprehend yet what is going to happen, even though Jesus has been predicting this and telling them exactly what was going to happen all throughout his ministry. There is nothing there that would lead them to look for what they are looking for. There is nothing in his ministry that ought to make you think that he is going to charge into Jerusalem and throw out the foreign powers that were and all of the other corruption in the governing bodies of that city and set himself up and to create a kingdom like the kingdoms of the earth, only more glorious. He's told you He's told you so often that is not what's going to happen here. Back in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, he is telling you, 
He is subverting your expectations. He is telling you this is not going to be what you're thinking about. This is not going to be what you imagine. You are not living the good life when you're healthy and wealthy. You're living the good life when you're poor in spirit. When you are mourning over the brokenness around you and inside of you, when that brokenness leads you to be meek and humble before God and before men, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, and righteousness as defined by the only righteous one. This is what they get wrong. This is what they get wrong on that road. They're happy to see Jesus, but they're not really seeing him for who he is. Not yet, not entirely. They don't see the coming triumphs for what it is. It doesn't look like much of a triumph. They aren't yet prepared to accept what God will provide. Even Peter. Peter, who's been there the whole time, has heard all of this, who's been right front and center in all of Jesus' ministry so far. Peter, who really ought to know what time it is. And when the time comes, Peter is the one who still hasn't given up on the dream. Peter still wants to see his kingdom come and his will be done in the way that Peter thinks it ought to be. So Peter draws the weapon of the world in an attempt to establish a worldly kingdom. Peter does what so many of us do. He tries to twist God's arm and to force the situation so that he gets what he wants, what all of these people want. They want. And actually, I think we can recognize how foolish this is. Right? And Intellectually, you know that you are a mortal being. You are finite. You know that you do not know everything, that you do not possess all knowledge. You know that you do not perceive everything, and that even when you perceive, you do not always perceive clearly. If you do not know these things, that's only because you have not taken the time to work past the evils of self-deception. Intellectually, it ought to be the easiest thing in the world for any of us to sit down and go, this is what I know about the human condition from my own experience of the human condition. This is what I know about God by definition of God. He is a being greater than which no other being can exist. He is the greatest of all possible beings. Ergo, God knows more than me. He sees more than me. He knows better than me. That's a different thing from knowing everything. He is more powerful than me. And that ought to be enough to humble you before God, to make you meek, and to cause you to, to see at least the futility of insisting on your own way against an omnipresent, omnipotent, omnificent God. But the Christians have an even greater understanding because we have an even greater revelation. And you see, we understand the fullness of the Beatitudes, starting with the very first. We understand that we are poor in spirit. We understand this. We understand that there is a poverty in us that transcends our finitude. That there is a disease of corruption within us called sin, which has affected every component part of our being body and soul. We understand that this was not always so, that it was because of the sinful choice, the first man and woman, that now as sin entered the world through one man and death was sin, now all are born into sin after him. We repeat the mistakes of our fathers. We earn the fall ourselves, even as we receive it from the moment of our conception from our ancestor. 
We understand that that has broken not only what is inside of us, but has also penetrated into the world around us over which Adam and Eve had dominion. And so when they fell, all that was under them fell with them. And our sin has further complicated this matter. And we understand this and we are broken by it. And so we have an even greater humility. So ours is not simply a humility of the lesser looking up to the greater. It is the humility of a debtor looking up to the one to whom he owes the debt, an unpayable debt. But we have an even greater revelation than this. And this is the revelation that Palm Sunday is pointing us toward. This is the revelation that it has come to realize. This is why this is the opening scene of the climactic act of all of human history. Because just as sin entered the world through one man, so too, through Jesus Christ, the answer to sin, redemption, grace, life more abundant and free, only through him. He is the way, the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father except through him. There's only one name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. So many places it points us back to this. And so we have the humility of one who is in debt, the wages of sin and death. We have earned death, and not just the death of the flesh, but the death of the spirit for ourselves. But God has given us a gift in Christ. He has released us from that debt. He has made the provision we could never make. And so our position of humility before God is unparalleled. There is no way anyone should be more humble than we are in relationship to God. And being so humble in relationship to God, we also ought to be humble in relationship to each other and to the world outside. That is, we ought to say along with our Lord, not my will, but thine be done. That is why when he taught us to pray, the first request that is made after two profound statements, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the first request is thy kingdom come. Then thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The first statement is a statement, the first request is a request of humility. The first statement is also a statement of humility. The first request is a statement of humility, a request in humility, putting ourselves in subjection under God, and yet so often this is what we do not do. We do not do this. Because while we can acknowledge intellectually our place in relationship to God, even as Christians, somewhere deep, deep down in our hearts, but we still act and think as though we had something to contribute. As though there were something that we could add to this. As though we really actually knew what was best for us. So we could come to God and uh, say to him, God, we need you to establish this kind of kingdom. We need you to do it now. We need you to do exactly this in this situation. This is the only possible thing. Forget all the other things that you had going on. We don't care about those. We want you to do exactly this, exactly now, and exactly for these reasons. We act like this, and then we wonder as the church is falling apart. You've taken the foundation out from under us. You do this all the time we do this. We do it in small ways in our own lives. Lord, this is what I want. Give me this. Give me this. Give me this. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. We've built whole systems of theology around that. Liberation theology. Prosperity theology. The new apostolic reformation theology, which is really just prosperity theology. Under a new guise. Even those of us who wouldn't prescribe to one of those schools when push comes to shove, we do the same thing. 
Right now, push has come to shove. It has shoved us out of the meeting places. It has shoved us out of physical assembly and onto the Internet. Those of us who were set up to do that and the rest of us are scrambling to catch up. And in that scramble, so many of us have gone into pronouncing, oh, this, is, this is good, this is pretty good, we're still doing church. No, you're not. You have no right to say that. You do not get to define what church is. You do not get to define how church is done. And people make the argument, well, they didn't have the technology back in the first century. Irrelevant. It's irrelevant. God knew everything. He knew what technology we would have. He knew that this crisis, this pandemic would be upon us. He knew all of these things. And he could have put in the Bible very clearly that if we watched the video online all at the same time, it was the same thing. But he didn't. He did not give us that. What we're doing now, it's not church. Not the fullness of church anyway. It can never be. It's the best we can do. We're compromising. We're compromising for love of neighbor. We're compromising for physical safety. We're compromising for a time, but that time will pass. We don't get to change our theology. We don't get to rewrite the Bible based on circumstances. We don't get to say today, oh yeah, being online is just the same as actually being in the pew. In physical proximity to your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's just the same. And then tomorrow when the crisis is past, turn around and go, oh, actually it's not the same. You need to come back in here. It, it never changed. Because we didn't define it. We don't get to make those things up. God does. And when we start making it up and we start compromising on what the Bible says, we have put ourselves above God. Even if we're doing it in a time of crisis, even if it's a response, we have to be careful. But the way that this works is it starts off with a small compromise. It starts off with a, a little mistake here or there, an error, an oversight. That reveals the nature of our heart, and then it starts to grow. We set a precedent, so then the next time we face a decision, we just go back to that precedent, we do the same thing. It keeps getting bigger and bigger until we've completely lost our foundation. We can do it as individuals, we can do it as churches, but we must not do it. Why? Well, we'll end up like Jerusalem did. And Jesus comes inside of the city. He pauses and he weeps. He pauses and he weeps and he prophesies over the city. That it's going to be destroyed. It all happened in AD 70. You can read all about it in Josephus' historical works. It's quite riveting in my opinion to see how this comes about. everything they were looking for. They got tired of waiting for God to give them what they wanted. That's what happens. They were tired of it by this time. They'd already tried a couple of times to do what they would do around 80, 70. They try it again. They try to do it in their own power. They try to do it their own way. They try to get what they want according to their means. And what happens? Utter ruination, total destruction and devastation, a tragedy beyond imagination occurs. That's the result it brings. And that's what will happen to us. That's what will happen to us. If we start leaning on our own understanding, if we start subverting the true righteousness, if we start saying that we are the definers of what is right and what is wrong, that we can make the rules, if we start acting that way, it will destroy us. Surely. Completely. Pastor, that verse is about Jerusalem. Specifically, we know the fulfillment of that prophecy. We've lived through it. We have the history that you just pointed us to. We know what that's about. That's not about us. No, it's not. 
but I think Revelation 3, where it talks about Laodicea, is. I think that is a grave warning to all the churches that begin to think that they are wealthy in their own right, that they see by their own light, that they are powerful in their own might. When they do that, they cease to be the church. They are ejected from the body of Christ by their own will. By the will of God. They become just like everybody else. Just like the world. It's what the world does all the time. It's what they do every day. It's what they're doing right now. They're trying to get their way. They're trying to get their idea of right. without bowing a knee. It's all about them. It's all about what they want. And if they bring God into it, it's just as a cosmic bellboy. So many people right now are very happy and rejoicing because the numbers are up on YouTube. The numbers are up on Facebook. We're, we're getting record views. People are praying and they're calling for prayer. Yeah, because they want something. They want something. And so the God that they never think about when they don't want anything, suddenly he's useful again. So, oh God, could you come here a moment? Yes, this, uh, this disease that you have unleashed upon the planet. Could you, could you recall that, please? Yes, we didn't hear this. Please take it back. Good man. Blasphemy. Heresy. Here's a real opportunity right now. Here's a real opportunity. There's an opportunity to correct bad theology. There's an opportunity to correct bad interpretation of the Bible. There's an opportunity to demolish the idol that we have built off in place of God. There is an opportunity here to cry out to people who are welcoming in their Savior King only, not as their Savior King, but as their servant who raises them up, who despise the humility of God we will surely turn their backs on him when they have received what they wanted. There is a chance to confront all of this and to show them something better, something truer. There's an opportunity to demolish this cosmic bellboy image that we have allowed to be built up in our culture and to put in place of it the God who knows better. God who's not like us who doesn't work like us, who doesn't think like us, who's better in all of those respects, the God who subverts our expectations, who doesn't come riding in with pomp and circumstance, but who has humbled himself and who is preparing for a greater humiliation. He enters the city humble. He leaves the city humiliated, broken, beaten, mocked, and scorned to his glory, but to our benefit. We have an opportunity right now to show people that God will give them what they need and that that is far better than getting what they want. We have an opportunity to call people to hunger and thirst for righteousness. But before we can issue that call, before we can take advantage of the opportunity that is presented us in the midst of this and every crisis that has come and shall come, for this will be again before Christ returns, if he does not return in this moment. But if we are to seize those opportunities, we must first be right in ourselves and know what righteousness truly is. If we are to do the work of our Lord, then we must be humble before our Lord. If we are going to call a world to repentance, we first have to be repentant. We have to be different. God 
has entered our society again. He has never left, but at times like this, he makes himself particularly known. He makes himself sought out, even if it's for the wrong reason. And people can find something that looks a little bit like him, and they can receive false hope that will not save, or they can see the truth, which is often not what we would like to see, not what we would have made ourselves, but it's better. It's better. Let me pray for us. Father, There is so much tragedy unfolding in our world right now. Lord, I have been told only to preach messages that will last beyond my time and what will reach beyond my locale. Lord, there may come a day when this message does not seem to play anymore. It doesn't seem to speak. Lord, until you return, we are told it will always have its season. Indeed, Lord, we ought to heed these words, to heed this imagery, to see the implications of this story, which are far broader than what I have said today. In the good times, so that when the bad times come, we are prepared, not just with a head knowledge, but with a heart knowledge, with a true understanding that have reshaped our identity according to your ideas. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, for we know we are not alone. There are many of your true servants who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, and not their idea of righteousness, but your idea of righteousness, who have really submitted themselves to that, who understand and appreciate that your ways are higher than our ways, as the heavens are higher than the earth. 